as long as he, he has, it is my desire to have a heart like he has. Amen. I think sometimes we get full of ourselves in the ministry and make it about us, and we lose sight that it's supposed to be about the Lord and ministering to his people with his word. Every aspect of the ministry is supposed to be about the Lord, not me. Amen. Uh, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Father, thank you, Lord, just for the privilege we have to be here today. Thank you, God, for the messages that we've heard already this week. Lord, what a blessing. How encouraging. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you'd help us now as we continue in the Word of God, that you would give us exactly what you need. Yes. Father, please, please set me aside. Speak through me what is needed for your people. I pray, God, that you'd be a blessing, be a help to them. Lord, I pray first and foremost, and, and, and Father, please be glorified in all that we say and all that we do. I pray, Father, the message would help us even to be more glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, we ask all of these things. Amen. Amen. Take your Bible, if you would, go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. I do thank the church for the opportunity. I thank you all for, for your hospitality. I appreciate the meals. I appreciate the basket, everything that you've done for us. Uh, it is undeserved, and I know that, but I thank you for it. 1 Samuel chapter 12. It's on, brother. It's on. Amen. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 12. I struggled where to start. The message, we, we, we must lay forth some groundwork. Let's start in verse 6. The Bible tells us, And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord which He did to you and to your fathers. What we have here is Samuel is dealing with the nation of Israel. He's dealing with them because they had desired a king. They wanted to be like every other nation. I fear that sometimes there are Christians who live in a life where they want to be like something God never intended for them to be. God fully intended that the nation of Israel be ruled by Himself. He had every intention that they would follow Him from the beginning of time, all throughout time, and He was going to be their King forever. And, and the Lord intends that He would rule in every Christian's heart the same way. And yet, there are so, you look around, there are so many Christians that think, oh yeah, he's, he, yeah he, but I want this King. I want me to be the King. My wife is my King. Maybe they don't say it out loud, but look at their life. That's the truth. And so, as you, as you go... As you go to what Samuel is dealing with, what he's doing, he's taking the Word of God, he's taking their history, and if you look at verse 7, he says, Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you. We come to church, we're crazy people on a Thursday afternoon to be in church, and we, we, we want to hear the Bible, and really what we, we have is men of God who would take the Word of the Lord and reason with God's people. And say, look, this is what God's Word says, this is what your life is, now let's put those together. Amen. Right where God's Word said. Amen. We're, not we're not trying to compromise. Oh, like, well, God, if you give up a little, and we'll give up a little. But Sammy wanted God's people to hear what God had done Amen. and so that it would affect them. Now, our, our, our theme this week is prayer, personal evangelism, and missions. And really, I, we're going we're to look at the subject of prayer again. But I, you can't help but see there's a little bit of personal evangelism in that he said, let me reason with you about what God said, and we ought to be able to do that. Now, personal evangelism obviously has to do with going and telling someone else about the Lord Jesus Christ, but how helpful is it when there's someone in your church or someone outside of your church, but a fellow Christian who evangelizes us when, when our hearts are hard and we're not doing right, and they say, hey, brother, hey, look, Stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord. What, what about all that God's done for you? What about all that God's brought you through? Why would that be your life when God has done so much? Why would you ask for something different when God has done so much for you? And that's what you find in, the, in Samuel here. And then he starts to reason with them. Now, what we'll start in verse 11. He says, And the Lord sent Jerubbabel and, and Bedan and Jephthah, and Samuel, I like that he used himself, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelled safe. And when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. 
hey, we want a king. Samuel says, you have a king. No, but we want a king like everybody else has. Why would you want a king like everybody else has? They lose. I, I want a king that never loses. And like, no, but we want to be like everybody else. You mean you want to, you want to win some and lose some? Is that what you're asking for? That, that's, what, that's what they wanted. No, we want a king like everybody else. We want to be like everybody else. I, I, it really bothers me. Church, it bothers me when you look at church and you find people in church who claim to love God who you can't, you can't decide if they love God or the, or the world more. I know what they say with their mouth. But Jesus said, he said, well, they honor me with their mouth. And a lot of people do that. But look what they're wearing. Look how they're acting. Look at the disdain they have for the Word of God. And you think, you don't love God. You're lying. Let's reason together. Even the Lord said, come now, let's reason together. Right. It, it, let's be reasonable. Listen to what the Bible says. So they wanted something. Look at me, please. Verse 13, now therefore, behold the king whom ye have chosen, and whom ye have desired, and behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. If ye will fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord and but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Verse 16, Now therefore stand... And see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. He says, Listen, you, 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 you need to understand that what you did isn't, isn't just acceptable. It's not like, Oops. That's not, that's not what he said. He said, you need to see just how bad it is. I think of the Apostle Paul when he said that the law came so that sin would be exceeding sinful. When you see what you've done against God, so many, and Brother, Brother Knox mentioned it last night, so many people will just excuse it like, oh, it's, it's, it's bad. <laughs> it's not good. Because you're talking about the King of Kings, the God of Heaven. And you wanted to go against Him. He said, you need to see just how bad that is. Notice he says in verse 18, So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. He, brought, he, he prayed. God did something wonderful in a time where there wasn't usually thunder and rain. God sent thunder and rain. And he did it, verse 17, to the point that they would perceive and see their wickedness. You've got to see that God's not for this. There are things that we do in our life. God is not for it. I, I, love, I love what Brother Knox said last night. It, it just I laughed, but not because it's funny. I laughed because how true it is that people will say things like, well, I, I prayed about it. You prayed that God would be behind you going against what He said? And the answer that you came to was that He was for it. You going against what he said? No. Didn't happen. It's a lie. I'm, like, I almost said I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Amen. It's a lie. He said you need to perceive, you need to see just how wicked this is. It's not okay. It's wrong. Now notice what happens. They greatly feared the Lord and same. I'm trying to get to the message of promise. Verse 19, the Bible tells us, and all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. Now if you followed, and we had the time to start in chapter 11 and go into chapter 12, all the things that he, he declared to them, how they were in and out of trouble on a regular basis. And, and they said, but we've added, we've added to our, our sins this evil. They realized, oh, this isn't good. We didn't do right. We wanted to be like other people. That's not, that's not where God wanted us at all. And they said, would you, would you pray for us? 
You ever wonder why they asked Samuel to pray for them? Because they knew they couldn't. We heard it last night very clearly. Church, there are people, if you don't pray for them, nobody's getting to God for them. Because they can pray, and we heard it. They pray. God's not listening. Right? I mean, we heard 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3, 7. That your prayers be not hindered. Live the life that you want and see how, how much of God's attention you have. None. It's, it's none. It's zero. So who, who's going to pray for that person then? Who does? Now, here, here's the interesting thing. We're going to look at another passage in a minute. It's so amazing to see that this group of people, when they realize their sin, when they realize their condition, they, they didn't say, oh, we got to go to the Lord and pray. They knew where they were. Samuel, would you do it? Because we heard last night in James, in James, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Samuel's not done wrong. Samuel pleaded with them to do right. Guys, there are people, pastors and, and Christians. Any Christian can be this guy. Any Christian can be this lady who, who doesn't compromise the Word of God. And when your family and your friends and your church members need someone to pray, they know they can count on you. Amen. That's Samuel. They know, you know what? When everybody else thought it was okay to do this, there's a family that didn't think that was okay. I'm in trouble now. I need someone to pray for me. I'm calling that family. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's a righteous man. That's a righteous sister in the Lord. And I need help. They understood that they needed help. And they knew where to go to get it. You find it in Samuel. Now notice, notice as we continue, we're a few more verses here. In verse 19, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. See, they understood the wrath that was, that was impending. They understood, hey, this is a holy God. We heard this last night. Listen, when you sin against God, can, can we understand that we sin against God? Right. You didn't cheat your brother. That's against God. Look, look. I think of Joseph in the book of Genesis. When he's being tempted the way he was. You know what he said? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He didn't say Potiphar. He didn't say you. He said God. Why did he say God? Because that's how he saw it. God give us people of God who understand that when we sin, it's against God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, high and lifted up, holy and in heaven. You didn't sin against the pastor. You sinned against God. And because it's God, the punishment you deserve is much greater than you probably think. That's why, Saul, that, that's why Samuel here says, let me see. Let you see. Let you perceive just how wicked this is. Because if you start to think, oh, Samuel, oh, yeah, we shouldn't have done that to you. You missed it. The fear of God and Samuel coming upon them comes upon them because they realized we're in a bad state before God. Help God's people to understand that God isn't just accepting you just because you're His child. And God's just not patting you on the head because you did wrong. God still hates sin. He didn't change just because you accepted His Son. He still hates it. Look at verse 20. And Samuel said unto the people, now notice the way that he answers this. He didn't answer them the way that, just immediately answered their question. Samuel said unto the people, fear not, ye have done all this wickedness. Let's not, let's not sugarcoat it, Samuel. <laughs> Amen. That, that, that you're right. You do deserve the judgment of God. You have done wrong. Yet, turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Isn't it wonderful that in spite of ourselves, we can still serve God? Isn't it wonderful that even if I fail God, I can turn around, repent, and still serve God? Amen. Praise God. Thank the Lord for His mercy. He says, Yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn ye not aside 
For then should ye go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. And I, I wanted not to say anything in verse 21 and actually preach the message. But guys, why are so many of God's children so obsessed with vanity? It's a waste. It does you no good. It doesn't matter. Let it go. Look to something bigger, better, and more eternal. Why are we so worried about whether or not this is in style or that is in style? Who cares? It's not in style to be a child of God, but it'll save me for eternity. I'll take it. Verse 22. For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake because it hath pleased the Lord to make you His people. So he's, he answers them by, by telling them what they ought to do. And then he moves on to what God will do. And then he looks at himself. Remember that they, they said, Samuel, pray, for, pray unto the Lord for us. And Samuel said here in verse, and I know we know this verse very well, but look at verse 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid. You know, that, you know that phrase, God forbid, means? You see that in the Bible over and over again. Paul used that thing all the time. God forbid. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He said that's not an excuse to sin. Thank God for his grace. That, that is not an excuse. for God forbid. That, that, that means no. <laughs> in case you wondered. Verse, verse 23, moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. I wonder if we look at it that way. Church, there are people that I pray for and I know for a fact that I'm the only one getting to God on their account. Brother Knox preached it very clearly last night. They're not getting through. You can't get through. The Bible says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. You're not getting through. God's like, no. There are people that you know. There are people who attend your church maybe. There are neighbors that you have. That the only person that might reach God is you on their behalf. And Samuel knew that about these people. And he said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. You know what that means? That means God intended that someone would be praying for them. I know we can look at people who are in sin. We can look at people who have, who have turned away their ear from hearing the law. We can look at people who would rather have the vanity than God and say, well, they deserve what they get. And a lot of times that is our heart. But it's a wrong heart. The right heart is Somebody's got to go to God for them. And it might as well be me. And it might as well be you. Somebody needs to reach heaven on behalf of somebody else. And it might as well be you. And God forbid that you should see someone else in their sin or in their condition or in their ignorance or in their wayward heart and just say, they deserve it. And not care. Shame on us. His phrase was, God forbid. Samuel knew, look, this is, this is, this is really neat. In, in chapter 12, Samuel is dealing with a group of people who understood that they had no power with God. They understood they had no right to approach God. But they also knew that there was a man who could do it. I want to be the man who can do it. There's always someone who needs someone else to go to God for them. You know, a lot of times we look at, we look at Christianity, and, and I do it, I'm guilty, that we look at people and we think, well, they, if they don't care, why should I? Because somebody needs to. That's why should I. Because when, when come to chapter 14, 15, chapter 15.
In chapter 12, we saw the nation of Israel understood their condition. In chapter 15, you're going to find a man who doesn't. But it doesn't change the way that Samuel responds. And that's a blessing. I'm encouraged by Samuel's heart. Because in chapter 15, for sake of time, we're not going to read the whole thing, but God, God goes through Samuel to Saul, and he gives him a command. In verse 2, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. And you look at verse 4 all the way down to verse, verse 7, it looks like he does what he says. But then he goes in verse 8, and he took Agag, the king of the Amal Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused that they destroyed utterly. Notice what's taking place. God said, this is what I want from you. You do that. Church, look, you, you have a, I mean, we have, I've got more than one. <laughs> I have several Bibles. There, there is no question about what God expects from a Christian. God didn't leave us in the dark. He told us exactly, Brother Knox, again, I don't mean to keep doing this, but last night he talked about a lot of things. But he told, he told you husbands, he told us, there's expectations for us. There are expectations for church members. There are expectations for wives. There is an expectation for Christians. We've seen over and over in the Bible that there are expectations laid out. And people think, well, I'm special. God didn't mean me. I know I'm supposed to be this kind of a husband, but God forgot to write in my wife. Nothing in here describes what I've got. Okay? And then you got, the, you got the woman. I was careful not to say lady. Amen. You got the woman who says, but he didn't write about my husband. I know I'm supposed to submit to my husband, but somehow I'm excused. Right? And we think, well, we've, we've, we have an excuse. So our situation is special. And then, and then we find that's exactly what, what Saul thought. So I thought, I, I did right. I did what I was supposed to do. Look. Look at verse 12. I, I know we skipped a couple of verses. Look at verse 12. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. That is very different than we found in chapter 12. In chapter 12, it was, Samuel, would you please go to God for us? Because we don't deserve His mercy, and we have seriously messed up. In chapter 15, you know what you find? Complete ignorance. I mean, he's talking to the man of God. You think Samuel doesn't know whether or not... I did it, Samuel. It's, I've performed the command of the Lord. How many times do you talk to people and they really think that they're okay? Oh, I'm doing all right. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> Samuel had to convince Saul that he wasn't doing okay. I mean, that's, the rest of the chapter is Samuel questioning Saul, but what about this? Well, what about this? But why, why are they bleeding? But, but to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. He, he is debating with Saul about whether or not Saul is okay. But notice verse, verse 10. Now, we, we know in, in chapter 12, they understood their position. Chapter 15, we can clearly see he does not. But look at verse 10. Then, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. 
Now we know that grieves God. It grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. Why? Why would he care? Saul, you did wrong. You disobeyed God. You deserve what's coming. That's not the heart of Samuel. He cried unto the Lord all night. Why? Because God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. That's why. Because his heart was such that whether or not you knew how bad off you were or whether or not you were completely ignorant to how bad off you were, somebody still needs to go to God and somebody needs to plead your case because you're too ignorant to see it. It's the truth. God's people sometimes can get ignorant. Sometimes we justify ourselves And sometimes we don't even see the reality. And we need a man of God or a woman of God who pleads with God, Lord, would you help them to see just how foolish they're being? Because if they went, we heard they're not getting anywhere. So who will? You find the life of Moses. Oh, it's it's a blessing. Over and over again, Moses doing the same exact thing. Why? Because who will? The Bible tells us in, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but He heareth the prayer of the righteous. We heard that last night. It, it, it is important that we understand that I need to keep my account with God short. It verily zero. Just so that I can, I can reach Him when I need Him. Or that I could reach Him on behalf of someone else. Yes, Psalm 68, verse 18. I thought for sure Brother Knox had brought this up last night. The psalmist said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe that if I regard iniquity in my heart, my prayer is hindered. And a lot of people don't understand. They're not getting anywhere because they think it's okay. And it's ignorance. It's ignorance. There's a whole lot fewer Christians getting God's attention than we probably think. But somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. I mentioned Moses in Numbers chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it. And His anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Why couldn't the people just cry to God? Because Moses had to do it. Why did Moses have to do it? Because they had no power with God. When Korah decided to be a rebel in the camp of the Lord, the Bible says in verse 4 of chapter 16, and when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Why would he do that? Because he understood, hey, oh, this isn't going to be good. And somebody needs to get in front of this thing with God. You ever look around? Church, look around. Even in God's house, There are people who disregard God. I hate to say that. It bugs me to say that. But it's the truth. Okay? So we've got to be in front of that. We heard last night how people destroy churches with their mouth and their bitterness and their hearts. We can prevent that. We get in front of that thing. I believe that. Because in the same chapter... In verse, in verse 21, God spoke to Moses and said, Separate from among you this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. God says, I'll take care of this right here, right now. In the next verse, they fell upon their face and said, O oh God, the God of all spirits, of all flesh, shall one man sin and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? What are they doing? They are pleading with God. Because, hey, yeah, Korah, he's a knucklehead. We understand that. But you're going to wipe them all out for him? 
There are people who will be in your church. It will happen. Where the bitterness has consumed them. And where their mouth will try to destroy the church. But God will protect it if we can get in front of it. And say, God, please don't allow that one foolish person in their ignorance to affect these others. Please don't let... Now, sin, sin complicates life. Sin messes things up. And we understand there's, there's always a side effect to those things. But there's a grace of God that deals with things differently. A lot of times the destruction of the church is because people turn a blind eye to it. A lot of times the destruction of the church is because there, there's a group of people who will get behind that rebel. But if we would say no... We're not going to do that. And we got God's attention instead. We could be far more effective. And I, I mean, I'm naive. Praise the Lord. I want to stay that way. I just believe that if we can get God's attention, that He's more mighty than that knucklehead. I just believe that. And I just believe that He can prevent damage that they're trying to cause if we can only get His attention. Now, I know in the heart of somebody is like, just wait, pastor, give it some time and you won't be as naive. I hope that day never comes. Amen. I don't want to believe that people are more powerful than what God can do. I don't want to believe that. I know it's true, but I don't want to believe that. We're almost done. What about the lost? You know, the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. We rejoice in that. But the Bible says, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. What are you going to do about it? Well, they've, they've chosen to reject God. That's their problem. Why isn't it your problem? Why isn't it my problem? God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray. We need it. Somebody has got to reach God for them. Somebody has got to care. We get so calloused in our churches about the world. We get calloused about the carnal Christian and we stand like a Pharisee saying, they deserve what they got. But who's going to stand and say, "But they don't have to be there. They need someone to get God's attention and say, God, will you show them just how stupid they're being? Will you show them how ignorant their life is? But a lot of times we just, ah, they deserve it. Shame on us for having that heart. It oughtn't be so. You know, I could, I could, I could be just as ignorant, but there are people who care enough about me to show me the right way. And there are people who pray for me can we look at one verse before we go to look at Luke chapter 23? Luke 23. <coughs> it should bother us that there are so many on whom the wrath of God presently abides. It should bother us. We shouldn't be fine with that. Jesus Christ is on the cross here in Luke chapter 23. Look at verse 33. Luke 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified Him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. They are crucifying Jesus Christ. A lot of times we look at, and in the scenario, no one did, no one, no one did Samuel wrong. He was just God's spokesman. And he went to God for them. In this case, they are doing Jesus Christ in his person the most wrong. In verse 34, the Bible says, Then Jesus said, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots, proving they had no idea what they were doing. 
But Jesus Christ hanging on a cross said, they don't know any better. God. Who would intercede for those who would crucify the King of kings and Lord of lords? He would. He would intercede for them. And He would say, Father, forgive them. They don't even know. Samuel goes to God, cries all night long for something Saul didn't even know. He was completely oblivious to how bad off he was before God. Samuel knew that the Spirit of God was departed. Saul had no idea. And Samuel said, God, would you, what, what can we do? How can we fix this? Jesus Christ hanging across His Father. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. Sometimes we look at people and we think they know what they're doing. They think they know what they're doing. But the reality is they don't. A lot of times, you know, when a Christian, I, I, I hate this, when a Christian lives in sin, a lot of times they're completely ignorant. Many people, now there are, there are those who are just straight rebellious, and I understand that. But many people would be different if they knew. And maybe we think, well, they know enough. But they don't. Obviously, they don't. And we ought to pray for them. And we ought to care for them. And we ought to reach heaven for them because they're not reaching them themselves. Father, thank you, Lord, for the Bible. God, more than anything, I want to be a help to these people. Lord, and I want to be a blessing to you. God, I pray that you'd use this little message. I pray that you encourage hearts. Help us, Lord, to see the need to be in constant prayer for our brethren, for the lost, interceding on their behalf. Lord, we need your help. I pray, Father, you'd open our eyes just to see how ignorant we are. Show us, Father, how we fall short. And help us, Lord, to draw closer to you through it and to care more for others in the process. We ask all this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wasn't that a blessing? Amen. Amen. Great, great.